Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tuesdays with BOA. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the uh, Director of Adult Programs at Writers and Books. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages, all currently available online. You can check out our current schedule uh, at wab.org. We're so happy to partner with BOA Editions tonight to bring you Matt Morton. First, we'll hear him read, then he'll be in conversation with BOA publisher and executive director, Peter Connors. Feel free to submit questions to the Q&A function. Matt's book is available through our bookstore, Ampersand Books. I'll put the link in the chat. Matt Morton's debut poetry collection, Improvisation Without Accompaniment, was selected by Patricia Smith as winner of the 18th annual A. Poulton Jr. Poetry Prize. Poignant, searching, and earnestly philosophical, Improvisation Without Accompaniment embraces uncertainty with a spirit of joyous playfulness. As Dean Young, author of Solar Perplexus says, these are poems of immense intelligence and presence as nimble as flames, conveying the un nearly unbearable intimacy this life demands, threatens, and rewards us with. Matt Morton's poetry appears in Agni, Gettysburg Review, Harvard Review, Tin House Online, and elsewhere. He serves as associate editor for 32 poems and is a doctoral fellow in English at the University of North Texas. He lives in Dallas, Texas. Matt, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Dan. And um, thank you to everyone at Writers and Books for putting this together. Um, and thanks to Peter and everyone at BOA for collaborating. Um, and thank you to everyone in the audience for your interest in my work and for um, showing up for a little bit to hear some poems tonight. Um, so I'm gonna be reading from the debut book, um, Improvisation Without Accompaniment. And I thought I would start with the title poem. Improvisation without accompaniment. In the field, the tractor spins its giant wheels. How fierce defiance is, or seems. Mechanical in a sense. Our pistons firing to set aflame some teepee of longed for brush. This being hopes kindling. Just once I'd like to witness beavers constructing a dam out of fallen timber, dead limbs crooked and bent. I'd like a roan horse, a wide open pasture to ride across. Laughter, a bottle of cheap wine. These acres of heartland filling up with snow and snow and for our next trick, will be, what will be expected of us? The chromosomes divide with such precision. This is the part where the origin myths diverge. Give me something gold to grapple with, three apples to juggle, a scrap of paper to fold into a dove. I have seen pigeons nesting atop the steel beams in the station as the trains arrive and depart, come and go. All I want to do is sit on the porch at evening in a pinewood rocking chair and watch the desert sun melt over the hills. But it is this notion of now that gives me trouble. There is no parachute, and that is sad. Not the wind, not the view. Two thousand miles away from here, my father is lying in a strange room being tended to. It is always getting later, no matter if morning is dampening the earth or burnt orange evening rending itself apart, the doldrums of afternoon stuck in between. This morning I was sifting through a famous nearly dead novelist's letters, wondering why he'd kept them all so neatly filed away. I wasn't certain, but I had an idea. An idea cannot fix a heart. It cannot douse a house on fire, which earlier I thought my neighbor's was, but no, he was burning wood in his backyard. Right now, I'm heating a frozen dinner. In the studio next door, a woman is singing, and a voice on the radio is trying to resuscitate itself beneath layers of static. I had an idea that each day seems the same, yet somehow shorter. Slight variances in the weather, 
rhythmic substitutions in the traffic's pulse. I'm not sure what, but something is long overdue. Do you understand what it is I am saying? Somewhere in America, my father is dying and I am sitting here listening to the radio. Um, this book contains poems that might be described as more traditionally lyrical, uh, possibly like the one I just read. Um, but it also, um, I think, provides a lot of evidence of just my sheer delight um, in less linear forms and structures, um, primarily um, including elements of collage uh, into my work and seeing what type of energy is created when two apparently dissimilar things are placed next to each other. Um, sort of like, here's a test for you, reader's brain or writer's brain, you know, what, what can you make of these? Um, and I just endlessly delighted when I read the work of other people that allow me to create that spark between two um, apparently unrelated things. Um, and this is a poem that operates to some extent in that way. Pinwheel floating on water. There is a feeling you may attach to the experience of sunbathing, of watching a landmark go up in flames. Perhaps it is a question of tone like the various forms a snowflake may assume as it falls apart in your hand. Paper lantern, silver dollar. Betrayed by his father, the boy dumps his box of marbles down a storm drain. Blue bonnets overwhelm an overpass, a charred field, a swan. For years, the smell of vanilla may remind you of a large hole in the earth. Little far-flung black star, is it just me or is there something about riding a train? Ever since you were a child, you will store his ashes inside a stoppered flute. I have nothing more to say on the subject of disappearing. Bright white light, white light, it is the dead of winter, it is strawberry season. Here, sit down with us. We are waiting for the show to begin. Um, I think one of this book's central concerns, at least for me, is the problem of mortality and the transience and fleeting nature of all experience, um, especially as a burgeoning consciousness moves through adolescence and young adulthood um, and comes to a deeper and deeper awareness of the implications um, and maybe becomes more and more insistent on trying to figure out how to deal with the implications of mortality. Um, but this is a poem in which the speaker, who's a relatively young child, um, experiences death for the first time um, and also witnesses the way that um, a very important loss can dramatically change the way we experience the same place before and after the loss occurred. And the mountains grew sirens. It was her lavender hands the wrinkles soft like crinkled cellophane, and the valley where we stayed full of log cabins, yellow tents, schools of rainbow trout shimmering the pond. Like a shepherd's crook, the moon guarded us, a tear in the canvas of dark, throwing light on the nervous mares stamping the stable muck. The pines, all the pines glossed with milk, glued to her side by the window, studying wings, Flash of sky, blue jay. Blacktop smeared with blood, red-winged blackbird. I wondered aloud, overwhelmed by the whoosh of the highway cars curling out of sight down the hill, and the clifftop triplet of crosses strung up by some hiker with aspen and twine, bodiless, looming like an empty well. She showed me, but then that night, her face, no one saw me see her face, its light burning out. She was not a deer in the meadow, then she was a ghost. A skipping stone makes circles, but a body makes a stone. They washed the lavender off the pillowcases. They caught me looking for her by the piano, and if it wasn't her, why else would the middle pedal stick halfway down like that? The word for that is stop, forever my dad said, which was a zooming out. 
I was small. They wouldn't let me see when the curtain closed. The black between stars, up and far away. They said, God, but when they sang, their eyes were shut. But if prayer, I held my brother's hand and we stood when they stood, and I could see it leaning on them, heavy their carrying hands when they passed in the aisle. But did she stop? Then in there I made myself, all the streaming and light stained by paint on the glass, and the snow erased the Indian paintbrushes, and the birds went with her, the field where no one walked, all a rushing, like bats, the storm of her going. Um, so I'm currently in Dallas and we don't have winter in Dallas. Um, but when I lived, uh, in Baltimore during graduate school, we did. And so I got to experience consistent snow for the first time. And I wrote this poem while I lived in Baltimore and I thought I would read it now to remind myself what winter feels like. It's called pale annual. Now it is winter. This is the waiting part. Like low dangling tinsel, eraser gray, the sky has been stripped of its shingles. A swath of off-white, a lack of shimmering. Look at the sun removed from its element, a violet-tinged sheet of old foil, bereft, balled up and stuck on a fish hook. This time of year again, its hallway drafts. Season of spindrifts, twinkling lights, wishful thinking. It is true that things have at times been hell, your head like a dynamite tunnel blown through granite. But so what if joy is not a precious stone, not perfectly smooth as we were led to believe it would be? Nevertheless, the cold days dwindle beneath the cracked white plate of a face, the blank sky, which is nearly obscured by our idea of a sky. It emits a dull ringing, like a teaspoon tapping methodically against the glass dome of a snow globe. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mentioned before reading um, and the mountains grew sirens that the speaker was a child and I've been really interested in what writing from a child's point of view could allow ever since I read um, William Faulkner's novel As I Lay Dying in 11th grade which remains sort of one of the formative moments um, in what later became a writing career um, and this poem is a persona poem and a self-portrait of sorts from the perspective of the youngest Bundren child, um, whose name is Vardaman. Uh, his age is never uh, made clear, but um, he seems to be somewhere around seven, eight, nine. Um, and I enjoyed writing this poem because I wanted to try not just to inhabit a child's mind, but to say what was true as simply as possible and see what happened when I, I made that attempt. Um, the epigraph is from the novel. And it's, my brother is Darl. He went to Jackson on the train, Jackson being where Darrell um, is taken to be institutionalized at the end of the novel. Mm -hmm. um, again, the poem is in the voice of Vardaman, the younger brother. Vardaman. I saw my brother crying on the box where my mother is. A big moon sawed in half above him, crying for what my mother took with her when she left the day. Where did she go? I asked my brother. It is always night where she is, he said. My brother's head is full of flames. I can't see them. I can see two blue circles like holes of sky punched through a fence. And why is there no smoke? One day I found something she wrote. I showed my brother and he took it and he said, you can keep a secret good. So I knew it was something that could be mine and his, but not for my father and not for my mother. My brother's brain is wrong, but my brother is right. It was night when he went on the train. The sun is on fire too, and it runs on tracks too. 
First it is night and then it goes up, up and over and then it goes down and then it is night again. Time must run on tracks too because it goes in a big circle and that is why clocks. A clock is a long time and it is also a short time. I have to do all the not telling myself now. Crying on the box of my brother, um, of my mother under a moon half, bright blue holes of shining. One day I'll go in a box too with night in it like my mother and my mother will be there and we will get on a red train and ride through the night trees and black leaves with moon on them to where my brother is waiting in the cool air with no more fire inside his head. Um, this next poem is another in a series of the, the poems um, entitled Improvisation, blank in the book, um, and comes at the um, project of improvisation maybe a little bit differently than the title poem did. It's called Improvisation in an Alpine Field. After months of snow-mantled mountains, spring. This evening, the meadow the hard ground which last week you would have sworn would never again give way to flowers is blotched pink with hundreds of Indian paintbrushes, which resemble neither blood nor confetti nor fire, though you often hear them described this way. This way. What do we mean when we say that? A heretofore hidden road, perhaps. A game trail of mud and hoof pressed grass through a stretch of nettles and briars to an open field where the flowers have bloomed again simply like flowers to be picked apart by the mule deer feeding at dusk. If you could be any animal, the question begins. And as with most questions, the answer, perhaps a stallion, an owl, matters significantly less than the person you have asked. He or she being the climate, you might say, to the question and habits. Just as you might say, the field gives context to the paintbrushes, which ask or seem to ask something now of us. We who have hiked here to marvel at the bare reared heads. As if the earth existed for this sole function of sacrifice to offer us whatever shape or color we desired. As if desire like the blazing flowers and the mindless silhouettes of deer were itself perennial. And we, after years of starting out, of setting forth, and finally having arrived at this particular unspectacular stretch of land, might now be granted some measure of clemency and could lie still, never again to anticipate watching the people we love disappear. I'm going to read three more poems from the last section of the book. I'm skipping over a long poem in the middle um, for, uh, for time constraint reasons. Um, when I moved back to Dallas from Baltimore, it was again, the coming home to the same place that was not at all the same as when I left it, in part because I was no longer the same person I was when I left it. And there was a weird cognitive dissonance there, um, being a different person in a different place, but also being the same person in the same place, um, in addition just to the stressors of moving. So um, my first year back uh, during my PhD in, in the DFW area, um, I was less than satisfied um, with certain things to say the least. And this is a poem sort of trying to make sense of that um, frustration or confusion. It's called The View From Here. What to make of the ridged alum aluminum awning behind the warehouse? A silver accordion? A model of the Swiss Alps? Where I live, the cargo trains arrest sleepers from scenes of technicolor oceans, their cheeks bruised, their heads full of songs that make no sound, like the esoteric graffiti that covers the metro station walls. Outside, phantoms split above the motel pool, drain, drained for the season and collecting leaves. Remember, every story has a moral. Two lovers are wrenched apart by war, then reunited at breakfast in a chalet. Or the weeping villagers cover a woman's head with a burlap sack place the body aboard a rowboat and set it aflame. 
In most arguments, both parties are at fault. So perhaps we shouldn't blame one another for the anxious zeitgeist, nor God, who one day woke to find himself transmuted into a moth. Forever the flames drip down the narrow channel toward the bay. Let us not forget to play, to skillfully escape the handcuffs of solemnity, the goopy entree everyone feels obligated to eat. I'm sick of searching for my reflection in the concrete fields behind my tenement. Better to be combusting, unbuckled and soaring, watching the sun collapse beneath the razor thin horizon, the violet clouds stretching out from the window seat like a sea of ice. The idea. Attend to what melts, what readily blooms, then wilts. A sort of heart monitor, a sizing up. Do not try, however, to iron the wrinkles out of the ocean as if happiness could fit in a peacoat pocket. The idea is to be always leaving the outdated versions behind. For instance, I was a weed impersonating a dragon. Then I was bruised but alive in the go-kart wreckage. When I say ocean, I mean big water-filled canyon. The idea is to notice cairn of stones on the tundra, whistling kettle, antler-scarred bark. I know moderation is the wisest course, but how difficult when I see your face not to smash my guitar on the coffee table and sing. This will be the last poem I read. It's called Dialectic. Back then, I always felt I was on the edge of something. A boulder half submerged in the Adriatic, a ridge overlooking the plains. I was a pioneer and didn't want to be. In one dream, I ran from tornadoes. In another, I floated through space, out past Jupiter, body long gone, looking around at the darkness, but with what eyes? Can't imagine that darkness. Now I wonder if fear is the appropriate response, given that we are, after all, going nowhere or not going anywhere. Words muddle. Maybe we're already ghosts and don't know it, my friend said while we were losing our minds in the park. A month later, huddled inside his car heart, he watched them lower her body into the earth, the coffin touched by snow. No, we must be here because my phone keeps ringing. The alarm on the egg-shaped clock on my desk is always threatening to sing. And I can't stop saying I'm sorry. I'm running late for the dentist. Another conference with my student who never shows up. Maybe he knows more than I do. Sees the edge clearly and doesn't care as he waters tomatoes on the roof of his building. Smokes a spliff midday. Lobs a water balloon at a man's third attempt to parallel park and Forgive me, I'm just a collection of thoughts that buzz like newborn wasps. The sum of affects, always at war, never sure which one's on top. Even now I'm elsewhere and running behind, but you were waiting for me where the cobblestone path winds down to the harbor's edge. I head toward everything lit up and distant. Aiming for you in the sea, I cut through drifts of fog that hang like tinsel on the Tennessee pines. Thank you very much. Hey, Dan, that was wonderful. Hey, thank Excuse you. Me, Matt. I'm so sorry, Matt, that was wonderful. It was so great to hear those poems in your voice. And I'm also so happy that uh, Patricia Smith is here and saw the reading. I don't know if you if you realize that, but she's here and that's very- No, special. I did not. And has uh, said in the chat that she's feeling very proud as she hears you read. I said she made a great choice. Well, I'm, I'm now feeling very grateful and happy not to have known she was there prior to reading. Um, but I'm very happy to know that she was there now. Thank you, Patricia. So you are, we've done a few of these um, uh, these Tuesdays with BOA readings now, but I realize you are the first Pool and Prize winner 
to be on Tuesdays with BOA. And I know that there will be um, people watching this who have manuscripts and are looking to publish their books and trying to figure out how to do that. So if you'd be willing, I'd love to hear a little bit about this manuscript's path through publication and also what it was like, you know, finding out that you had won the pool and prize and, and the book was going to get published and Patricia Smith was going to write a forward to it. Yeah, um, it was a very long process, um, as it, it sounds like it usually is. Um, I wasn't one of the lucky ones. So the earliest poem in the book was written um, during my first year at Johns Hopkins um, during my MFA. And then the last poem in the book was written during my first year at UNT for my PhD. So um, I spent another year and a half or so assembling the manuscript. Um, so all, all in all, it took three or four years to write and then another year to assemble and then the um, sending it out everywhere um, and paying many submission fees uh, and, and receiving many rejections. That process started in earnest. Um, and I did that for two years and the book was only a semi-finalist once or twice, was never even a finalist. And so I was I mean, quite shocked when I found out um, that uh, Patricia had chosen it. And I was very, very proud that she had been the judge to do so. But uh, I think you remember me on the phone, I said, what do people usually say right now? Like, uh, so um, it was a mixture of relief and elation um, and the whole process of putting the book together afterwards, which really continues that process was delightful as well. And I learned about a lot about that too. So um, persistence and, and luck, I, that's the only thing I can chalk up um, the fact that my book- it and a great manuscript that you polished. Spending a lot of time on that manuscript. Yeah, absolutely. And as I'm sure you know, two years is, is not a long time to be um, sending it around either. Although, you know, depending on who you are, that either sounds like not a long time or a very long time. But from our world, that is, that is certainly not a long time. One of my favorite stories is we have a poet, Chris Kennedy, who was sending out his first book, you know, to different places. And one of the places he would send it to be uh, to would be the Yale Younger Poets Prize. And he sent it and he was a finalist three times in a row. And then finally he aged out and he wasn't a younger poet anymore. So he couldn't oh, no. go on publish in the Yale Younger Poets Prize. <laughs> so two years is, is really nothing. And it's such a fantastic book. I, I feel really fortunate that Boa published it and, and grateful to Patricia for finding it out of a lot of manuscripts. Chances are, you know, we usually start with seven, eight, nine hundred submissions from that contest. So it's very competitive. Um, Absolutely. I'm also really interested in you know, you, you come from a small town in Texas and there's a lot of um, personal stories and things that you bring into this from throughout your life. But I'm curious as a poet, how do you make those decisions about, you know, I'm going to share this information, but maybe with, you know, not share this information. I'm, I'm curious how you work through that process in writing and maybe in revision too. Absolutely. I was thinking about that this afternoon when deciding which poems to read. Um, the, you know, I was sort of raised on um, some of the more associative poets um, like Dean Young, like John Ashbery, Mary Rufo, uh, Roger Reeves, etc. Um, and so this idea of, the, of, of what happens in the mind and the imagination being part of one's autobiography has always really resonated with me. Um, you know, if I'm daydreaming, I'm just as much living my life as I am as I'm walking around the park. Um, but the extent to which autobiographical, de and sorry, in, th in that sense, any poem is autobiographical, right? Because it emerged from, you know, some sort of uh, flow state or conscious experience that the poet had. Um, but in terms of autobiographical details, which a number of the poems in this book do contain, um, I think I wouldn't want to share anything in a poem that I don't think the person the poem is referring to would be uh, uncomfortable with, clearly. Um, I myself am probably less comfortable reading the poems that are more explicitly autobiographical than the people um, who are in the poems are hearing them. Um, but I do think that um, it's sort of a constant balancing act going back and forth, like how much do I want to reveal? How much about 
me as Matt Morton does anyone care about and how much should I focus purely on sort of um, what I'm intending to either within my imagination or in the outside world. Um, I, right now I'm sensing a tension that, uh, that tells me I don't want to like talk a lot about autobiographical material and yet I don't think that's necessarily um, a, a feeling that needs to be an authority but it's interesting that it percolates up. So definitely poems that are more autobiographical they have a different um, a, a different mood to them or a different quality to them in my head where they feel a little bit more, not even necessarily more vulnerable, but more more revealing. You know, I mean, there's no other way to say it. So, um, but I also think honesty is more important than, than shying away from something you're uncomfortable with. So again, keeping all literary ethics in mind, um, I'm, I'm happy to have books that are uh, more explicitly autobiographical in the book that are you know about my family members um, and then and, uh, other poems that approach these same questions of family or mortality or place from uh, a less explicitly autobiographical perspective. I think that's um, a lot of times when people after the first book you know you, you start working on new poems and sometimes there's that feeling of like now I've done you know the material from growing up or I've yeah. done the so I'm curious too about, you know, I, I guess, first of all, do you think in terms of like next book or do you just go poem to poem? And also, do you feel like there's some material like, okay, I've done that, you know, and now, now I'm, I'm going to do something different or new or fine, or you can go back and keep, you know, keep finding new nuggets from life experience. Absolutely. Yeah. I think what I found is it's sort of a spiraling upward where I will sort of write a bunch of um, I'm going to use some reductive, like structural terms, like write, write some poems comprised mostly of image lists um, or that are heavily associative. And I'll say, then, and then I'll read a poet like, you know, Marian Moore or um, you know, Richard Hugo, someone who's doing something totally different than that. And I'll say, oh, that's, that's what I want to do. I, I never want to write another image list poem again, right? And, and I'll sort of like decide that that's somehow, um, evidence of a more immature version of myself. And then enough time passes and I spiral back around. I think, you know, I really want to write some more poems with a bunch of like cascading image lists in them. Um, and I'm a different person now. So it's not there. I, again, this is maybe showcasing some of my neuroses, but I think there's a fear maybe as writers that if we do anything that feels like repeating what we've done in the past, that we're going to get stuck um, in some rut and, and be and, and pigeonhole ourselves more um, might be more of a risk than being pigeonholed by others as a as a certain type of writer. Um, but I don't think of books in terms of projects. I really wanted this first book not just to be sort of like, and here's the culmination of the MFA poems, um, but to really be something I'd called from both my my masters and um, and doctoral work. At the same time, it feels like a first book to me, which is just it is. Um, and as I'm thinking more about the poems I'm working on for my second book, it doesn't yet feel like a coherent project. Um, and I'm not sure that it ever will in the sense of having some sort of governing conceit that drives everything um, during the writing process itself. But I do feel like the poems, for better or worse, um, are moving further away from that sort of autobiographical material um, that we've talked about. And yet not at all divorced from my personal experience or the themes that I was using the autobiographical material um, as lenses in this book through which um, to explore things like like transience and um, what, it, what it means to live a good life um, in the face of the shortness of that life, things like that. Th those remain um, obsessions and arguments I'm having with myself and um, I'm not sure I'll ever finish that argument. We'll see. Yeah. That's beautiful. You know, one of the um, things I, I found interesting, I was thinking about the book today and specifically the title Improvisation Without Accompaniment, which I remember when I first heard it, I assumed was going to be related directly to music. I thought in terms of jazz, just because, you know, the, the improvisation, that's where my mind goes to, but also accompaniment, you know, is a, is a common musical term. And so, you know, especially reading that particular title poem, the fact that there was no music, you know, that there's no references to music. There's, in fact, there's no references to, there's no phrase improvisation without accompaniment in that poem. And of course you have the repeating improvisation 
poems throughout the book. So I'm curious, what does the, the word maybe improvisation mean to you? How does it fit into, into this book and to your poetry in general? Um, the word resonated with me for a number of reasons. Um, and again, it's possible that my opinions on some of these things will change over time. And so this is just what I believe at this current point in my life. But, um, you know, the book's first section especially sort of details um, not an entire loss of faith, but a, a sincere questioning of the religion uh, that one was brought up to believe in. And, um, you know, whether it's God or nature or creative force, you know, it, if you feel like there's anything larger than yourself in, you know, that exists anywhere, um, that provides a sense of security and comfort, whether it's true or not. Um, you know, there's a real benefit to, um, to feeling that sense of belonging in the world. Um, and since, since con con I'll just add, since conceiving of the title with this notion in mind, it actually kind of broadened my own perspective with regard to these very things. Um, Cause the title I think does get at this notion of life as an improvisation, unplanned, unscripted, um, we all sort of have to make up our own rules or routines as we go along. We're creating our own consciousnesses and personalities literally in real time. And if there's no larger power to use a kind of cliche phrase, um, well then who's to help us with that other than the people around us who we love. So um, I liked the notion of, of life being an improvisation despite the loneliness of thinking that one is sort of going it alone because I, I am often a prisoner of my own mental rigidity. And so re realizing that anything is allowed, um, you know, with, especially in terms of writing um, and that life doesn't have to fit one of several molds um, and that really you can kind of create yourself the way you would create a poem and give your life form as it unfolds in real time. That was very freeing for me and exciting. And on a microcosmic level, the same thing applies with poetry. Um, I, the first poem I remember reading and loving was Wordsworth's um, Tintern Abbey, uh, which is, you know, metrical and not at all improvisational in the sense that I mean, um, when I think of other poets like the ones I named earlier. Um, but I really first, I guess, caught fire with poetry um, when I read the work of Dean Young and John Ashbery and some of these poets who are moving in a more, um, who are interested in, in the poem being a record of its own creative act, um, who are interested in poetry as process in addition to a sort of perfectly finished um, kind of artifact that, that has no seams in it whatsoever. And of course, these are also false categories that often overlap and we can we could have a long conversation about what polish and improvisation even means because of course it's not like they I beamed these improvisations down onto the page magically right you know I've revised them there's there's much about them that's not spontaneous but it is a, a frame of mind that I try to um that I try to get into and I'm sometimes successful getting into when I sit down to write where anything can happen or, or, or that's the intent is to hoping to believe that anything can happen and, and those are the moments that feel truly improvisational, whether the poem is narrative or, you know, full of associative leaps, but where it sort of comes out of some part of me, but that I didn't know was there before. And that's really exciting. That's a great answer. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes me, as you were speaking, I just thought, you know, in a lot of ways, improvisation is, is synonymous with creativity, at least in my head. It's almost like you can't, you can't have one without the other. Um, I think creativity depends on sort of giving yourself up to that spontaneity. Um, Absolutely. I've been thinking a lot about the importance of letting go in order to access the state where you act, you're still some version of yourself, but either with certain things added or certain like mental clutter removed. Um, and you can do it 99 times and it's still kind of scary to part of your brain on time number 100, right? So. Um, I don't know, I, I found I've had to like tinker with my process and things like that to, to escape from myself in order to get into this other place all of the time. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. Well, it was so great uh, talking to you, Matt, and I'm so thrilled about the book and so glad that we published it. And I wish you all success with it. I am going to um, bow out and ask you to read one more poem, and then Dan's going to come and wrap up for us. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thanks again, Peter. I really appreciate it. All right. So I'm going to close by reading the, um, the last poem in the book, which serves as an epilogue of sorts. It's called Looming's No Longer. I was all freshly a glimmer, wave persuaded into a gold possibility. At first, a marsh, a murkily seeming surface. But magnified, our practiced roles of shrinking turned up false, and strangely so how the beacon of dreams we imagined could be so easily swept aside. Now it was his shadow of terror who shrank. No, it was not the hoped for endless autumn stowed away, but a nevertheless little gift, a balance beam. One half level way to look, one half calmly stealing oneself in the wind. Leaves burnt on occasion, sharpened their edges. The costumed sky became merely the sky. I thought to my waking morning self, would that I might for year beyond year discover myself just so. Because it is, after all, a large fine planet, a giant sea. I do not owe, but give thanks for such bright and brief sufficiency. Thank you all again. I appreciate it. Thank you, Matt, for, uh, for uh, sharing your work with us. Uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you to Peter Connors. Uh, you can buy Improvisation Without Accompaniment at our uh, bookstore, Ampersand Books. The link is in the chat. Uh, and uh, you can join us next week uh, for Tuesdays with Boa. We'll have short fiction writer Mark Polanczyk. So I hope you can uh, come in. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, have a good night. <laughs>